welcome to this interview with uh, Mitra Katarescu uh, as part of the celebration of the publication in Penguin Modern Classics of his great breakthrough work of fiction, Nostalgia. Uh, my name is Boyd Tonkin. I am a writer, editor and journalist and currently a member of the Council of the Royal Society of Literature here in Britain. And it's a very great privilege to be able to talk to Mircea Katarescu uh, uh, under the aegis of the Romanian Cultural Institute in London. Now, normally I talk about um, new books, so um, it's a, a special occasion that we're talking today about Nostalgia, which uh, Mircea Katarescu first published in 1989, although the full edition didn't come out until 1993. Uh, Mitra, of course, is Romania's, one of Romania's best known, most prolific, most influential authors. Uh, he was originally a poet. Nostalgia marked his emergence as a writer of fiction. Since then, he's become known for a series of extraordinary works such as the, the three parts of Blinding, um, Solenoid, uh, most recently Melancholia. He's also continued to practice as a teacher of literature, a professor at the University, University of Bucharest, and he's published his journals, and he's been rewarded with several extremely significant international literary awards, including the Franz Kafka Prize and the Prix Formentor. Um, and uh, so in talking about nostalgia, we are going back really to uh, the moment of his emergence onto the wider literary scene, fully 30 years ago now. So I'd like to start by asking Mircea, um, when you look at nostalgia now in 2021, uh, do you recognize the person who wrote it? Um, does it still strike you as something uh, that you could write today? Or does it seem to be the work of a stranger? Um, thank you so much, Mr. Tonkin, for uh, this um, amazing question um, that you asked me. It's, uh, it's um, something that I thought about uh, millions of times. Um, and now um, I remember one of uh, the stories uh, written by Borges, where he met, uh, being a, an old person, he met the young Borges um, one day um, in a park on a bench. And they met and uh, the old Borges was amazed about the, the younger one because uh, he um, felt that in a way he betrayed um, the, the initial, um, um, well, ideals and thoughts and uh, um, dreams and so on that the young, uh, younger writer had. But in another way, he evolved. He evolved. He, was, he wasn't the same, um, fortunately, I would say, because he enriched his work. Um, he um, gave uh, his work uh, new di dimensions, new uh, frontiers, and so on. He crossed new, new frontiers. So it's good to be faithful to your um, dreams as a young man, but it's also good to be different. <laughs> yes. I tried to be different. I'm very jealous of uh, the young Cartarescu who wrote, uh, wrote uh, Nostalgia. I know that now... I couldn't do it um, because nostalgia, nostalgia is a book uh, uh, which you can only write when you, you are a young writer. And uh, when you feel that everything is open in front of you, you can say everything, you, you can be everything. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think that I could have done it better. I could have done it better. So if I had to write it today, I would have, I would have uh, um, done it in a different way. Yes. Uh, nevertheless, I appreciate um, um, 
the young Cartarescu's uh, ambition <laughs> to, to do something yeah. significant. Yeah. And uh, I, I, never, uh, I never discharged th this book uh, from my work. Uh, I think it's, uh, even now, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a book uh, without time, uh, a timeless book, uh, which could be read uh, any, any time and any place, in my opinion. Uh, this is what I appreciate most uh, with this book. Um, it's not uh, dependent of an epoch or uh, um, of a place uh, and something yeah. like that. It's like uh, the, the universality of the fairy tales in a way. Yes, yes. Now, one way uh, it, it, in which it's universal is that it, it's highly poetic in many ways. And of course, you began as a poet you, you published uh, prolifically several collections of poetry. And I'd like to ask about your move into prose fiction, why it came about, why you changed your genre. And also, do you think that the poet that you were still lives in, inside the prose writer you became? Um, poetry, in my opinion, is an ambiguous word. It can mean uh, two different things, um, at least. Um, poetry is the art of the verses, first. So if you write verses, if you write a collection of poems, you are a poet. But at the same time, poetry is a way of seeing things. Uh, poetry is, uh, is uh, something that is very much embedded in your personality. Um, so, uh, giving up to be a poet in the first uh, exception of the word, I never gave up to be a poet uh, in the second one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my, uh, my books of prose are very much indebted to my uh, first years when I wrote uh, mostly poetry. Why I um, shifted from poetry to prose, um, it's, it's easy. At a certain moment, I felt that poetry is, is, became too narrow for me, too narrow for what I wanted to say. Uh, poetry is like any art, kind of limited. If you are a musician, you cannot uh, describe images. If you are a dancer, you cannot sing and so on. So poetry at a certain moment, uh, well, um, started to, to, to embarrass me in a way. I felt that I wrote too much poetry. I, I had written by that time uh, about uh, eight volumes of po poetry, um, about 1,000 pages of poetry. I thought it was enough. I thought it was enough and I tried to evade, to escape poetry by that time. And I fell in love with the art of prose, which even now I think it's more serious, more, uh, um, I don't know, uh, more substantial. Um, in a way like uh, as compared to, 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 to poetry. Um, being a poet, uh, it's in a way easier. You can cheat, you can cheat in poetry. You can um, um, drop words um, or as uh, Selinger said, uh, um, you can uh, um, uh, make uh, very, I don't know how he said, fascinating uh, um, bird drops or something like that. Uh, I, I, I don't want to cheat. I want to be honest in everything I do, in poetry and in prose. So I embraced the art of prose when I was about 30 and never woke up from this dream till today. I'm, and I'm very happy to be a prose writer. Thank you, thank you. Another aspect of nostalgia I wanted to ask about is its evocation of the Bucharest of the 1970s and 1980s and of course you published it in the dying days of the dictatorship of the Ceausescu regime. Can you try and say something to us about what it felt like to be a young writer, a young artist in that period? Did you feel constrained? Did you feel fearful or was it a time of hope and possibility of something better? Um, well, you know, uh, Mr. Tonkin, 
uh, when you live in a dictatorship, everything you do uh, with an honest mind and an open heart is, uh, is uh, against the regime. Not only direct um, action against the regime, uh, but uh, a free mind is uh, very dangerous for the dictatorship. Uh, I was, by that time, I was part of a group, a group of uh, young intellectuals and uh, writers and critics and so on, uh, artists, uh, who absolutely despised the regime and everything that happened by that time, and who tried to have a kind of a dissidence um, um, in the middle of, uh, of uh, our um, community, the Romanian community, uh, being at the same time against everything that happened in our politics, but pro in a way for the needs of uh, the people who wanted to read good literature, to go uh, into good exhibitions of, uh, of uh, painting and sculpture, to see um, um, avant-garde, uh, to listen to avant-garde music and so on. So we felt we had a duty towards our readers, towards the spectators of our uh, art, to do fine art, to do fine art despite the conditions that we had, to do, the, to do it despite the regime, despite the censorship, despite everything. So we wanted to be real artists, living in any time. Actually, uh, if you consider the, um, the ancient literature, most of it was written be, um, in times of dictatorship, um, in times of um, horrific uh, dictators like uh, Caligula, like, um, I don't know, Helio Gabalos and uh, yeah. other monsters like that. So we wanted to have nothing to do with uh, the politics of our monster and to, to, to be able to write fine literature, uh, no matter if it was uh, published or not, no matter if uh, we um, lived underground, we were underground, marginalized and so on. But we wanted to do fine literature in our language because this was our duty towards our community. Yes. Yes. And uh, it's interesting that what you say is in some way the opposite of what young writers in Western liberal democracies feel, which is that to be a pure writer is superfluous and somehow useless or trivial or parasitic. And what they should do is um, commit their talents to forms of social struggle. I mean, this is what many young writers and artists in the West um, feel today. But for you, the struggle was precisely in producing the best possible literature. Um, am I right? That's... Um, uh, you are right, of course, uh, but uh, not entirely, I would say. Um, I don't see myself uh, as a pure writer. I never saw myself as a pure writer, but I always thought that doing the right thing in literature, like every, like in every other field of, of life, is very important. Um, I wouldn't say that I, I um, disagree with the, the younger writers that, that you mentioned. No, I agree with them in many, in many, in many ways. I myself, uh, I'm a uh, a, a person who only spoke uh, in behalf uh, of, uh, on behalf of, uh, of uh, um, the people that are not uh, so privileged, uh, of the people who suffer, uh, of the people. I, I, I'm not. Uh, um, um, I'm not uh, um, indifferent to the problems of the world, but I think being a writer. Uh, you have to be a good writer first, and then uh, um, speak about the problems of the world. So uh, um, I think being a good writer is uh, doing a good literature, uh, a good literature um, uh, where the aesthetic uh, criterion is the most important. 
Thank you, thank you. And I also wanted to talk about one aspect of nostalgia, which I loved, um, which is there in many of your other books, which is the evocation of the city, the city of Bucharest, and particularly the child's experience of the city, which is both extremely realistic, but also magical. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to ask about your own experience um, uh, growing up. And did the city seem to you as this um, amazing labyrinthine place as it appears in, in, in your fiction? Um, you know, um, I come from a um, lower, uh, lower uh, uh, social uh, uh, stratum. My parents were um, simple uh, workers and um, um, I, I grew up uh, as a very, very normal child for, from a poorer, uh, uh, a poorer uh, um, um, milieu, let's say. Um, I could um, have contact with my own city um, after I was 20. Uh, till I was 20, I never uh, left the slum where I, I grew at the margin of Bucharest, at the outskirts of Bucharest. Uh, that was my world. My mother was, uh, uh, was very fond of uh, movies. And uh, she, when she came from the countryside, she defined uh, a, a small, uh, um, I, would like, uh, I would like to say, a small village inside Bucharest where she stayed and never left it. Uh, so this village was a sort of a Bermuda Triangle delimitated uh, 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 um, from uh, three, uh, uh, with three uh, cinemas. Uh, there were three cinemas, uh, like in a triangle, and we lived between them, among them. Uh, and we went, uh, week, week by uh, uh, week, by week uh, we went uh, to one of, of them to see movies. Um, well, um, movies from, um, from India, from uh, other places, uh, melodramas and so on. And, um, I, I had no image of Bucharest till I was 20 and till I went to the faculty. And when I got into the center of the city and saw for the first time a real city, I thought that Bucharest, I, I sincerely thought that Bucharest was the most beautiful place in the world because I hadn't, I, I didn't know anything better. Um, I only had this experience. I saw the buildings in the center of Bucharest, historical bu buildings from the 19th century, and I thought, wow, um, it was wonderful. And this is the Bucharest that is present in nostalgia. The yes. Bucharest seen uh, through the eyes of an adolescent uh, yes. and of a child, of course. Um, I was amazed when I saw it. Uh, I remember my first uh, day when I went to the faculty, it was autumn and uh, there were those uh, spider, uh, spider uh, silk in the air yes. and um, yes. many beautiful women uh, crossed, uh, crossed the, the boulevards and so on and uh, lots of cars and things like that, yes. which I never, I never experienced till then. Yes. So I, was, I, I suddenly fell in love with my city. And um, I thought be, um, being, uh, being very committed to become a writer, I thought myself, uh, well, um, Dostoevsky had his own city, St. Petersburg. Um, Lawrence Durrell had Alexandria. Borg has said, uh, had Buenos Aires. Joyce had the Dublin and so on. And I tremendously wanted to have a city only for myself. Uh, a city yeah. which um, reflect my my personality, and yeah. I thought Bucharest is good enough for me, and yeah. this is why I um, I started to write about Bucharest in nostalgia, and then in um, in um, Orbitor, in Blinding, and then in uh, in Solenoid, but unfortunately the city became um, more and more ugly. <laughs> uh, um, when I, I wrote uh, more and more about about it, yeah. Um, uh, and uh, can you 
can you still recognize the city of your adolescence or is it does it exist only in memory now has it become purely a city of imagination i recognize it as i would recognize a, a, a very old, old lover of mine a lover who was um, very beautiful when i was young but now she is a lady of my age um, so I'm not in love with Bucharest anymore, but uh, but I have a huge nostalgia for it, nice. um, and uh, I I still I still uh, uh, like it very much. I think uh, uh, Bucharest uh, is still a mysterious city. Yeah. Uh, it's still uh, it, it has a, its own life, um, yeah. uh, and uh, it takes some time to feel it. Uh, I don't know if you ever went to Bucharest, but. Uh, at first, uh, it's it's nothing special. It's like uh, any other um, capital in uh, in uh, Europe, only worse because it's not renovated and so on. But living in it, you become uh, uh, very much uh, um, conscious of its charm, yeah. and you yeah. fell under its charm. In in my yeah. opinion, even today. Yes, um, and. Um... When you, I'm interested, when you travel around, are you, uh, do you look for cities that somehow replicate that experience? Uh, in other words, do you have a, a, a kind of geography of the mind in which you appreciate places which, which um, bring back the same kind of experience? Yes, I could never travel um, till the Romanian Revolution because we yeah, didn't yeah. even have passports by that time. And I thought I would uh, never travel. Um, uh, I prepared myself to live my whole uh, life in my country. But after the, the revolution, this is the most important thing that um, I, uh, I experienced, uh, the, the, the possibility to travel everywhere in the world. And I took advantage of it uh, as much as I could. Um, I think after the revolution, a quarter of my life uh, was spent abroad uh, in different places where I stayed for some years and or for some months and so on. And uh, I kind of traveled all around the, the, the globe. Uh, and this is uh, one of this is one of the greatest experiences I, I had. Yeah. My first travel was directly in New York City. So you can imagine uh, my cultural shock, yeah. my cultural shock that I had uh, coming from the totally destroyed Romania during Ceausescu's regime and being parachute, parachuted in the Big Apple. Um, I, I can never tell um, this shock uh, and this, this um, amazement that I had. Of course, I knew a lot about uh, the States and, uh, and um, New York and so on, but to see it, to touch it, yeah. to, to give, um, to, to have the feeling of it, it was absolutely amazing for me. I remember my first day um, when, when I had the jet lag and I wasn't, I was kind of uh, dizzy uh, and I woke up at six in the morning and walked down the streets of New York. Nobody was there, so it, it was uh, um, too early. Uh, everything was closed. And um, uh, I, I, I never, I never uh, forget uh, that, that day, which was like in a movie, like in a movie. And I stayed uh, in the States for three months um, in 1990. Uh, and uh, this changed my whole perspective about, uh, about life. And when I went home, uh, I wrote a poem, one of my most important poems, um, which is called The West, uh, about this uh, experience that I had, which is much similar if you, uh, uh, if you remember the poem of, uh, of uh, T.S. Eliot, the, the, uh, the Journey of the Magi, yes. um, where the Magi come from a, from a, a, a specific world and yeah. get to another one, and yeah. at, at last they don't, they, they feel that they don't belong uh, yeah. in neither of them. Yeah. Because uh, this, uh, this adventure changed, uh, changed them for yeah. good. This is what I felt when visiting uh, New York by that time. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. And I want to, to talk about the, the, the title of nostalgia and what, what the, the concept of nostalgia means, because, of course, it, it's, um, it's often in critical usage a quite ambiguous term. It's not something that people will automatically approve. It can be, it can be a negative um, concept. It can be something that, that implies um, sentimentality or escape yes. from uh, the present. What, um, what does it mean specifically for you? And uh, is it something that maybe underlies all literature, the act of remembering, of revisiting the past yes there is a huge uh, bibliography of course about uh, this uh, this concept i met this concept concept um, um, in the works of uh, jean starobensky for example who has a book uh, on uh, nostalgia i don't know uh, uh, melan melancholy and so on uh, Susan Sontag wrote about it, yes. and uh, it's a, one of the most important concepts of postmodernism, yes. revisiting, as you said, revisiting the past, revisiting the past and trying to recreate the past, to recondition the past in a way. Um, and um, I think uh, um, this wish of the writers to, to be in, in the shoes of old writers, to feel what they felt, to see what they saw. It's, it's really very, very interesting and very important. That the, and there were big works of art that uh, originated in, um, in, in it. For example, Giorgio de Chirico, in my, in my opinion, is a very nostalgic uh, painter. Or Umberto Eco, when he wrote um, In the Name of the Rose, he tried to, uh, to recreate um, a, a, a love of, of the past uh, in Italy as, uh, in the 16th or 17th century. Um, and um, um, the postmodern, the, the American postmoderns like John Barth, for example, started to write in the language of the old ages. Uh, the Sotwith Factor yeah. is written, um, uh, is, it's, it's written by, by a poet uh, from the 17th century, 18th century, sorry. Uh, so, revisiting the past, um, having uh, empathy towards the writers of the past, uh, in my opinion, it's uh, really very interesting. And my, my book, where I did it um, without any compromises, is, uh, some people say it's my best book uh, so far, it's called The Levant. It's, it's a long poem, a 7,000 uh, verses poem, which recreates the history of the Romanian literature. Yes. So it's a huge and continuous pastiche parody. Yes. Um, I don't know, uh, polemics with yes. um, all the styles of the Romanian literature, yes. like in that episode of Joyce, where Ox the, the, the oxen English of the sun, language, yes, yes, yes. The oxen of the sun, yes. where the yes. English... Yes. Um, uh, language is uh, yeah. developing uh, yeah. in a monstrous way. Yes, that's, um, and uh, although it's uh, stylistically very sophisticated, what struck me with nostalgia is always the way it reverts to the the experience of childhood um, mm. and the foundation of literature in if you like, in the child's imagination. Um, and uh, I wondered, uh, do you think that, that uh, for a writer, is it essential for a writer to, to keep in touch with the child self, with childish per perception, which of course is a cornerstone certainly here of English romanticism, being able to see through the eyes of the child is is that do you think that's significant for fiction as well i think uh, staying a child all, all your life it's um, important and I, I would say essential not for not only for the artists but for everyone um, 
um, being able when you are um, 65 as I am or um, um, at any age actually, being able to, to see things like a child, uh, to um, have that uh, ingenuity and uh, that um, um, clean, uh, that, that light heart, I, I would say, um, the child has, uh, it's really very important. It's really very, very important. I, um, and I uh, absolutely appreciate the people who, despite of the um, life's uh, um, struggles and uh, I don't know, uh, unpleasant uh, parts, uh, they uh, uh, succeeded to stay uh, genuine, infantile and, uh, and clean and clean to, to have a clean heart. Um, of course, a, a, a child is not only a, a little angel. Um, on the contrary, we know from uh, our uh, um, psychoanalytic uh, experience uh, that um, children are actually um, very complex, are very complex. Uh, they have uh, very many levels of, um, of, uh, of thought and they, they bear traumas. They bear traumas. Uh, can be in your in your uh, childhood. Uh, you can have uh, lots of uh, uh, traumatic uh, events that will reflect over your uh, en entire life. So a child is for me more interesting, like uh, an adult. And I always preferred to speak about uh, children or adolescents uh, instead of speaking about um, uh, grown ups. Um, because a child is not quite a person. He's a bit different. It's a sort of an anamorphosis of a, of a person. He um, um, uh, has different, uh, um, uh, I don't know, um, different uh, um, um, shapes of his sensibility, of his uh, uh, behavior and so on, which is, um, which are uh, uh, closer to, I, I would say uh, um, closer to um, either monstrous or uh, angelic, but yes. most of the yes. times, both of them at the same time. Yes, yes. So, so the, 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 I'm glad you mentioned those words because the, the angelic and the monstrous, they're two, they're two forms of being which you find a lot in nostalgia. Um, and uh, I wanted here to talk about the the influence of uh, the world of dreams and specifically how the, the world of dreams becomes uh, available to literature through the techniques of surrealism. Now I know that surrealism was very important to you, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. your contemporaries in Romania. Does it remain a, 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 a central part of, of what you do as a writer? Has, have, you, have you kept faith with surrealism, if I can put it like that? Um, well, actually, Mr. Tonkin, um, um, our um, young Romanian literature, pretty young, only two centuries, um, started with um, a writer who is for us um, uh, the equivalent of uh, your Shakespeare uh, or... Um, uh, Cervantes or Goethe, uh, uh, who is um, the quintessence of, uh, of our culture, Mihai Eminescu, as you know uh, very well. And Eminescu was uh, uh, a writer from the family of the German romantics, um, like uh, Novalis, like, um, uh, I don't know, um, Hoffman, um, Chamisot, and uh, many others. Um, he uh, believed in um, the dream world, in the dream life. He wrote about dreams. He, he was obsessed with dreams. And um, he uh, discovered that uh, the dreams are not something, uh, uh, well, uh, a sort of a, uh, vapors, but uh, uh, they are essential. They are, um, um, I would say, uh, um, um, they are uh, uh, the most important uh, um, archetypal uh, uh, skeleton uh, 
of uh, of the of the being of the soul soul so he wrote a lot about dreams and he initiated this uh, 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 trend of uh, fantastic literature in uh, in in uh, the Romanian language in the Romanian culture uh, and uh, Mircea Eliade followed him he was one of Eminescu's followers and we the younger writers follow Mircea Eliade and uh, of course um, surrealism itself comes from the uh, German romantics yeah. mixed with the uh, psychoanal psych psychoanalysis and um, surrealism uh, at uh, its uh, turn influenced very much all the uh, literature of uh, imagination for example the the, the Latin American uh, writers um, Cortazar uh, a lot of uh, um, 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 of uh, myths and uh, ways of putting things like in the uh, German romantics and like in surrealism and all the other Marcus, uh, Vargas Llosa and so on, all the other um, writers bet on imagination and uh, the Romanian writers are kind, are very similar in a way, most of them are very similar to the Latin American writers uh, sometimes uh, um, um, somebody said it, um, somebody said that uh, actually Romania is a Latin American country who got lost in Europe, uh, which is not uh, not uh, a bad thing to thing to say. So uh, um, so uh, uh, I follow this uh, trend because um, I I I love to write uh, uh, from my imagination. I I really love love it. But uh, as well as writing from your imagination, of course, you, you one other important part of your literary practice is the way you've written and, and published your journals. And mm -hmm. could you say something about the relationship between your journals and your fiction and why the practice of being a diary writer is important to you? Um, I always uh, loved the writers who have who keep a journal. Uh, for example, Kafka, who is my hero, um, actually wrote everything that he did in his journal. He did not make um, a distinction between his uh, novels, uh, his uh, short stories, and his uh, journal. He wrote them all in the same notebooks. And Virginia Woolf, of course, had a, a wonderful. Uh, journal of a writer uh, and not only uh, i write journal uh, i have always written journal from i was 16 so uh, my journals are my second skin uh, i write uh, in um, those notebooks i i will show you one of them because it is always uh, on my uh, on my desk i write most mostly every day uh, almost every day uh, from I was 16 till now, I think I have, I don't know, 10,000 pages till now. And I started to publish uh, from my journals. I published uh, five uh, volumes so far uh, because I think they are not different from uh, my uh, literature. They're just like that, just like uh, my novels or just like my short stories. Um, it is the best thing that I do, in my opinion. Um, all my novels, all my, all my other books are like the fruits of this big tree, which is my journal. Uh, I define myself uh, many times not as a writer, but as a person who writes. Uh, not, writing is not my profession. I, I, I do not see myself as a professional writer. I see myself as a huge lover of writing uh, and uh, of reading as well. Um, before being a writer, uh, I praise myself uh, as being a reader. Um, I have always read a lot. Uh, when I was an adolescent, I read eight hours a day. I uh, remember when my mother became uh, a bit, uh, a bit, um, a bit angry with me because of it, uh, and uh, she said, "Everybody is going to the to the football, and you stay here and uh, read all the time. It's not uh, uh, sane for you." 
but uh, this is uh, this was my life my life was among books and i'm very happy with it and if i would live uh, the second time i would choose the same the same life because reading the books are um, for for me uh, ha has always been the greatest pleasure thank you and um, i read somewhere uh, this really fascinates me that you still write by hand is is that the case um, and has your the actual practice of how you write has it changed at all or is it just the same as it always was Yes, I write by hand because I write journals, journals, and you cannot write journals uh, on the computer. Um, I have always written by hand, with some exceptions, my articles and my academic uh, books uh, are written by computer, of course, on, on, the, uh, on the computer. But uh, my literature is written by hand, and uh, I think that the, the readers could feel it because writing by hand is writing with your own body. You write with your, with your own body, your hand is, uh, is part of your body and uh, you, don't, you don't put something between you and the paper. You don't put um, a typewriter, a computer or anything. Um, and it's so nice to make those little circles and those little loops of, of, uh, of writing, writing by hand. And at the same time, another peculiar, peculiarity of my writing, which I never met um, um, in, in um, the biography of any writer that I, that I know, is uh, that I, I never edit. I never edit. Everything that I write, uh, be it um, um, blinding, which is uh, 1,400 pages, uh, I wrote from the first letter to the last one without editing anything, without, um, I don't know, um, erasing uh, words, without uh, changing uh, um, paragraphs between them, without uh, tearing out the pages. I never did it. So all my books are the first, dra first draft. Yes. Um, and my publisher in Romania knows it, knows it very well and never changes anything because they know that I can do it like that. It's yeah. the way I write. Yes. Um, do, you, do you think that that's a, a big difference here between what you've described of the, the writer's original vision and say in a lot of the English language public, publishing tradition where there's almost a cult of the editor where we're always learning, for instance, about how Maxwell Perkins edited The Great Gatsby, and um, yeah. uh, there are many other examples, even of how Ezra Pound edited Eliot's uh, yes. The Wasteland. Of course. You think there's a kind of cultural division here between the, the uh, cultures that value uh, the editor who intervenes and those that value the original vision of the writer? Um, yes, uh, for a writer, uh, the editor and the translator are um, the right hand and the left hand. Uh, so you cannot do without, without them. Yeah. They are the most important persons, persons in your life as a writer. And um, I consider myself very happy uh, and very lucky uh, in, this, uh, in this respect because I have always had in my country and abroad, some of the best um, editors and translators um, ever uh, for the Romanian language, language I mean the translators. Um, I um, have the huge pleasure to work with, uh, for example, my um, Austrian editor from Paul Jolnay Verlag and uh, with my Spanish editor from uh, from uh, Funambulista, from Impedimenta, sorry. Uh, and uh, having a publisher who really believes in you, it's a huge experience for a writer because uh, publishers, in my opinion, are of two kinds. The ones that um, are doing their jobs um, and the ones who are your friends. Um, when a publisher is my friend, my close friend, and who 
and who who really believes in me, who really loves his loves my work, uh, everything changes. Um, he can um, share his enthusiasm with the others. He can do things for me. He can uh, he can uh, promote uh, really promote uh, my books, while the others uh, well do whatever they can without uh, uh, getting to know me uh, personally and without willing to know me personally, actually. I'm a writer among others for them. Yes, yes. Now, I wanted to ask more about your relationship with your translators, because obviously that has been crucial to the way your work has been disseminated around the world. Now, some writers I know, um, once they trust their translator, they are happy to stand back and let the translator do their job. It sounds from what you're saying that you like a, a closer collaboration. Uh, is that the case? And which languages do you uh, feel confident about collaborating with, with the translator? Um, yes, it's a very good question again. Um, of course, um, I my work is translated abroad uh, for uh, almost 30 years. Um, and I um, had lots of experience uh, experiences with lots of uh, translators. Some of them were among the worst. Uh, there are the worst uh, in, um, in, in absolute. Yes. And some of them, uh, uh, of course, uh, were... Um, really geniuses in their in their in their work um, I, I I am also I would like to say that I'm also a very happy uh, a, a happy person because uh, I work now and I've been working with them for uh, the last 20 years uh, with the really the best translators from Romanian into other languages uh, um, that uh, exist. Um, for uh, example, for the, the French uh, space and for the Spanish space, for the Italian one, for the Dutch one, for the Swedish one, and uh, for the um, um, British one and American one, for the English language, I have really tremendous translators. And I never check them. I never check uh, uh, their work. Uh, um, I never um, try to, to see if they are reliable or not because I know they are. Because I know they are. Uh, we, we work, uh, we have been working for two decades and I, I have uh, uh, a complete faith in what, in what they do. Uh, I'm not, uh, um, I'm not, uh, scared that they will uh, they will uh, present my work um, in a in a false way or in a not adequate way I, I i know they they love my work i know they love me as a as a friend and i know they they try to do the best the best that I, that they can um, the art of translation is a sort of a cinderella uh, of um, of the arts, and it's a pity because uh, a good translator can um, can make you um, uh, can 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 invent you in another language, and a bad translator can tra can can destroy you. Yes. Can destroy yeah. you. Yes. This is um, and for a, a a person like me coming from a small uh, culture and a small language. Uh, the translator is uh, the second writer, is the second writer. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a very important person. Yes. Well, maybe this is the moment to reassure people that the translation by Julian Sabina... Oh, it's a, it's is, a very good one. ...is it's remarkable, really, yes. It's really yeah. a very good one. Um, yeah, Julian Semillian, who did it, um, is um, himself a poet, and uh, he took part in the flower power movement uh, in, um, in uh, yeah. the States in the 68, uh, in the 70s and so on. And uh, he is 
he's really very good. I was surprised how good he is in, uh, in, um, in translation uh, because I only knew him as a poet uh, till then. Yes, no, it, it, it's, a, it's a great piece of writing in English. Uh, anyway, that, that we can be sure of. I wanted to ask an, about another aspect of your career, which is the way that you kept on being a university teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, you've never stopped being a critic, an analyst, a theorist of literature alongside your work uh, in fiction. Is it easy for you to, to move between those two identities, the creative identity and the critical identity, or are they just all part of the same process, of the same um, adventure, if you like? Um, you know, um, my personality, as much as I understand anything from it, uh, has two sides. Um, it's a side of an artist and a side of a, an intellectual. Um, um, in a way, it's um, not uh, quite easy to, to put them together because uh, um, there's a, a very old uh, um, discrepancy between, uh, between uh, the two, the two uh, person personalities. Um, it's hard to uh, put together the subjectivism of an artist and the objectivism uh, that uh, uh, an intellectual should have, yeah. or a literary critic should have. Uh, but I tried to uh, to survive, uh, being <laughs> split in two all the time. Um, teaching at the university and writing uh, academic books, I wrote a book on postmodernism and a, a book on uh, Mihai Eminescu I told you about, yeah. uh, is 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 uh, is the real job for me? Um, I, as I told you, I not I'm I'm never call myself a writer. It, this is not my job. This is my vocation. Um, my real job is uh, to teach at the university. I ha I have always thought I have forty one years uh, of uh, teaching, and um, I do it with pleasure because I I love to be among young people. I admire the young people. I, uh, I love to be um, uh, a friend of them. I love to learn from them and uh, to, to share my knowledges with, uh, with them. And I love to teach Romanian literature. Uh, the Romanian literature is uh, rich. Uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's uh, surprisingly um, uh, modern. And uh, uh, it's my job to, to, to teach it to the youngsters. Um, I would say that uh, the Romanian literature is like those uh, uh, crystals that you find uh, uh, in a mine, um, and uh, uh, which are shining and very beautiful, but nobody sees uh, them. Nobody ever sees them because they are underground, because they are buried in the in the in the ground. So um, my job is to take some pieces of mind flowers, as we call them, and yes. bring them uh, yes. outside. Yes. Um, and it's, it's a huge pleasure for me. Yes. I was interested what you were saying about your sense of Romanian literature being buried. What can be done to bring more of it to light? We've talked about translators and their importance. Do we maybe simply need more good translators or more publishers who are willing to uh, bring more Romanian literature into English, especially where there isn't very much? Yes, it's a crucial uh, question. We always uh, ask uh, ask ourselves uh, ourselves the same question. Uh, this question has. Uh, uh, several uh, different answers, uh, who, uh, which, uh, which uh, must be must be focused together to get the the the, the picture. Um, first, uh, it's it is the duty of um, our um, cultural institutions in our country 
to promote the Romanian culture abroad. Uh, they did uh, this uh, sometimes uh, um, in a good way, sometimes uh, and many times uh, in a wrong way. Um, they, there, is, there is always a place for, uh, for improvement here. So uh, our institutions like um, the Romanian Cultural Institute, uh, which is the host, uh, our host today, and uh, some other ones uh, should do their best to promote the Romanian uh, artists, the Romanian musicians, the Romanian uh, um, directors, movie directors, the Romanian writers abroad. Otherwise, it's hard for simple individuals to, to to, um, uh, to become uh, well-known uh, um, abroad. Uh, and another part of the, the, the answer is that, uh, of course, uh, the, um, the publishers um, abroad should become, uh, in a way, more interested with um, the writers coming from uh, from uh, uh, marginal cultures, marginal, I would say, In advanced with, with many with yeah. many quotation yeah. marks, yeah. because actually no no culture is marginal. The center is where I am all the time, no matter where where we we live or in which language we 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 write. Uh, but this is a, a complicated thing because. Uh, a publishing house is a business. Uh, we should not forget this. Uh, a publishing house is not charity. Uh, they uh, need to sell uh, the writers, the books. And uh, to sell a book, that means that the writer should be somebody, should be somebody, should ring a bell um, to the readers, to, in the readers' minds. Yeah. So um, it's a paradox, it's a paradox here. Um, to be published abroad, a writer should be, should be already famous, but you cannot be famous but by being published abroad. Yes. So yeah. each, each writer uh, from yeah. this kind of smaller yeah. cultures, let's say, yeah. have, are are very much conscious of this uh, uh, of this uh, situation where they are, uh, of this condition they have. Uh, so. Um, I think uh, in my case, uh, um, again, I say I was lucky. I was lucky because some publishers uh, noticed my books, some of them trusted in them, some of them uh, uh, even uh, succeeded to sell them. Not uh, like uh, Coelho's uh, books. <laughs> it's not my dream to become, uh, to, to sell uh, millions of copies. But uh, in a, um, well, uh, normal way uh, to enc encourage the publishers to do more. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and just before we end, one last question, which is, bears on what you've just said. Sometimes I meet writers around the world who write in what are are sometimes called minority languages. And again, of course, no language is, is a minority language if you speak it. But sometimes if like you, they speak English very, very well, some of them are tempted to actually write in English. Um, what do you think about that? In other words, overcoming the barriers of translation by choosing to enter the world publishing sphere as an English language writer, or possibly as a French language writer in other areas? Um, no, I don't think it's necessary that uh, uh, I myself uh, would write in, um, in another language, in a foreign language. Uh, I think there are good enough uh, translators for it. I'm very comfortable with my own language, which is a uh, a, a, a very good language, language for literature, a very rich language. Uh, so I let my translators to do this um, very hard uh, job uh, to translate not only um, the Romanian words in, uh, in English words, for example, but the Romanian culture and the uh, habits and uh, personality 
uh, into the other into the other culture into the other uh, community i would say um i'm happy with uh, uh, with uh, uh, my translations i think that more and more people uh, uh, um, are able to read me uh, and um, i'm uh, very much waiting for uh, the event that in my opinion will change my uh, my uh, destiny as a, an international writer the the publication of uh, my very important my crucial novel solenoid in um, in english in uh, the english uh, space um, uh, which will happen uh, if uh, i'm not wrong uh, next spring uh, with uh, deep vellum in uh, in the states i think uh, solenoid um, change the way the people see me in uh, in um, spain and uh, in italy and in sweden already among other countries and i'm waiting for this to happen finally to happen uh, for the english speaking world well that will be a great occasion and um, while we look forward to that at least we have the translation by Julian Similian of um, Nostalgia, just published by Penguin Modern Classics, and a wonderful introduction to the work of Mircea Katarescu. And Mircea, thank you so much for talking to us uh, this um, afternoon. It's been a great pleasure. I thank you so much, Mr. Tonkin, and I really appre appreciate that you are one of the people who really uh, appreciate yourself the what i call the marginal cultures the marginal writers uh, who may be sometimes big surprises uh, thank you for uh, uh, this uh, kind care and attention and thank you for your wonderful questions uh, in this uh, in this interview this evening thank you so much thank you very much indeed all right bye bye for now bye goodbye